Hello and welcome to a new episode of Digging in the Doom. Uh, I know this one has taken a little bit extra long to get here. Uh, obviously, given who I'm talking about, uh, for those who don't know, Rachel Pollock, uh, not only the subject of today's episode, but also someone who was generations ahead of themselves. Uh, unfortunately, she did pass away very recently. Uh, on, around the time I was getting this episode together, I had hoped to put it out before she passed. Of course, she had been in uh, struggling with health for a little while now in a battle with some very bad health issues. Uh, Neil Gaiman was, of course, keeping everybody up to date on what she was doing, and there was all kinds of misinformation flying around. Uh, some people had thought she had passed weeks before. I myself had fallen for a death scare. Uh, so it was in this constant state of flux, so I ended up deciding to kind of, once she did pass, to get all my thoughts together, get all my notes together, and make this episode truly uh, a celebration of her, of her unique status, not only in comics, but in the world. Uh, the amount of fucking just courage and strength she had, and what... Uh, Anyone who knows her story and anyone who has read any uh, stories from her, from her can really gain from it. Uh, so this episode is going to be a big celebration of life, a big celebration of what she has done. And it's going to be a little bit interesting because, of course, <laughs> the series started off just going through different Doom Patrol eras. And last episode and this episode are going to be very, very much spotlight episodes on the creators themselves. Particularly, obviously, Rachel Pollock for this episode. Last episode was Grant Morrison. Uh, and also what's interesting is uh, Rachel Pollock's main notoriety doesn't come from comics. Uh, she wrote the literal Bible on tarot. She is one of, if not the most celebrated tarot writers of all time. She wrote uh, 78 Degrees of Wisdom, which is not only a book that is packed with info, but like the Bible is one of the things that people learn something new every time they open it. Uh, it is something that people have studied for years and years and years. Uh, a lot, again, a lot of her tarot work is more so what the wider world will probably recognize her for. Uh, we, of course, are going to talk about Doom Patrol Run. We, of course, are going to talk about her comics here. We, of course, are going to celebrate all that as well. Uh, but obviously, there was so much more than that to her. So uh, this is going to be a rare episode where we're just going to go through a little bit of history with her because... Sadly, there is not a ton of info out there readily available for her uh, due to a lot of kind of different political reasons, different whitewashing reasons, all kinds of just stupid shit that's happened over the years for someone that, uh, again, was so ahead of the curve and so ahead of her generation, ahead of several generations, and someone that ultimately just was able to live her life her way. Uh, and it's something to truly be celebrated for. So we're just going to start at the beginning. Uh, Rachel was born in Brooklyn in 1945 to a quiet little Jewish family. Uh, graduated school, got a job as a teacher at a state university in Pittsburgh, and married a woman named Edith Katz. She kind of tried to live a normal life, uh, make the best of it she could, uh, but throughout it she had talked about in a lot of her books and stories and short stories how... She was experiencing a constant desperation inside of herself to be herself at this point. Uh, for, again, for those who, I guess, do not know, uh, Rachel Pollock, a transgender icon for many, many reasons, and at this point in time was trying to live as a man, trying to live against her natural self. And so in 1971, at age 26, a co-worker introduced her to tarot. So a co-worker introduced her to tarot, and this is kind of be the first domino block that would fall to really start opening up her life over the next decade. She uh, put out her first short story, Pandora's Bust. That was published in the science fiction magazine New Worlds Quarterly. And around this time, she fully came out as a trans woman named Rachel. Uh, there's a quote from her uh, her 2018 release, uh, Beatrix Greats, that goes along with this really well, uh, which is, I did not want to be a woman, I already was. So her and her wife, at this point, started studying tarot more and more hardcore. They started traveling all across Europe, eventually moving to Amsterdam, where she became a professional teacher of tarot. And over the next few years after that, she assembled all of her notes, all the things she had learned over the years, and she put together and created 78 Degrees of Wisdom. 
again, when I call this the tarot, the Bible, the tarot, that's what a lot of people refer to it as. This is something that I can't get away from, from emphasizing how important this is to that world. Uh, a world, again, that I am, uh, tarot worlds I've always been very interested in, tarot, cult, everything. Again, I, I got a Doom Patrol podcast, let's be honest. I think most people who are into Doom Patrol, especially the Doom Patrol I am, uh, are probably in a similar note where if they don't practice tarot, and don't practice things like that, they have at least done some deep diving into those worlds. Uh, and not only that part of her life being important, but very soon after that, Pollock and her wife Katz became involved with the UK Gay Liberation Front in London. Uh, their whole demands and their whole motto was absolute freedom for all. Uh, and at the time, even in the GLF, even in the GLF, they weren't sure how to treat a trans woman. They weren't sure how to handle an outright trans woman. This kind of led uh, Pollock to, uh, with Roz Cavani, to form a subgroup that was focusing on transsexuals and drag queens at the time. Uh, again, verbiage and vernacular time changes. Uh, a lot of what I'm quoting and going off of are moments of the time and Times have changed so fast that words like I know uh, words like that have in themselves become taboo and have different meanings for different people. Uh, Because again, like I mentioned earlier, she was so ahead of her time. Again, you're talking about 70s and 80s doing stuff that just today is starting to really be recognized. And she was in that first wave of it. Uh, So again, she formed this group for outsiders to the outsiders. And the political back and forth of it all got uh, got overwhelming for her. Sister and her members in the group were trying to tell the trans members what to do and say, how to act, and how they should behave. And it became a bigger and bigger issue. It got so bad that Pollock was assaulted at a women's conference for refusing to leave. Uh, looking back, she's talked about openly in more recent years. She's reflected that much of the infighting was due to a lack of major political progression in the first wave of gay liberation. You had a lot of people that were fighting tooth and nail to be themselves and to try to get their rights, their basic human rights. And at the time, it fell on deaf ears it, to a lot, a lot of people. It felt like they were screaming to avoid. They didn't realize that they were laying the bricks that the foundation of today's revolutions were being made on. They didn't realize they were planting the seeds. They just felt like they were screaming to an empty void with no response because that response wouldn't come till years later. Um, and so with all this going on, uh, she kind of focused on writing and she continued to write more. And then she started focusing on speculative fiction and she published, uh, nine short stories and three novels throughout the eighties in 1989, released an unquenchable fire, another just foundational work of hers that if you have not read, I would highly, highly urge to go seek out and get, especially if you are a fan of Grant Morrison's new patrol, Grant Morrison's recent book, Luda. Uh, a lot of speculative fiction, a lot of weird fiction, a lot of uh, high concept idea fiction. Go out and get it. It is beautiful, incredible. It's uh, unfortunately the only novels of hers I actually physically own. Uh, and it's something that I didn't get to read till earlier this year. And I'm so, so thankful I did. I read it in prepping for this. And it is an incredible work. It is, I don't know if I would say it's better than Doom Patrol, her Doom Patrol run, because of course it's extremely hard to compare the two uh the apples and fireflies type of comparisons they are completely different but uh if you're a fan of doom Patrol run definitely seek out unquenchable fire definitely because that uh, will be 100 percent up your alley uh and around this time at a party a random meeting occurred with editor tom pyre at dc which led to them talking about doom patrol and eventually her sending him writing samples, which quickly got her the gig for Doom Patrol after Morrison was set to exit. And Pollock had a ton of respect for Morrison. Characters like Danny and Rebus, uh, plus the overall use of minority, the non-heterosexual relationships as a key foundational point in his stories, obviously, you know, meant a ton to her. And like I mentioned last episode, those were stories that have they aged greatly, have they aged poorly, no matter what, they were still stories about people being represented by their own selves again morrison didn't come out till non-binary till very recently but looking back at, <laughs> at the characters like rebus and danny and things like that it's another oh shit that makes total sense type of moment uh because 
there's always the clues there whether you want to see him or not. <laughs> and it would make complete sense that you would have Pollock come right after Morrison and, of course, have a ton of respect and admiration for what Morrison had laid down. Uh, Pollock did aim to ground some of the higher concepts of Morrison's run while maintaining that free spirit and creativity. Uh, we've talked about before that Morrison was never afraid to embrace the silliness, embrace the campiness, embrace the fun. And neither is Pollock. I will... Uh, spoiler for anyone listening to this that uh, hasn't heard my opinions on this in other podcasts or places, that uh, Pollock's run is up there with Grant Morrison and Gerard Way for me. In my head, my kind of holy trinity of Doom Patrol are, you know, it is Gerard Way, Rachel Pollock, and uh, Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison, Gerard Way, Rachel Pollock, their Doom Patrol runs uh, almost also form this weird uh, this weird triptych and this weird trilogy that wasn't meant to be. Uh, but they embrace so many of the ideas that I think what I love about Doom Patrol, they're the ones that I think fully recognize that and fully recognize what Doom Patrol could be, what it made it special, what made it different. So Pollock aimed at, a, again, aimed at bringing a little bit of realism. It's still Pollock and still their idea of realism. So her idea of realism started in Doom Patrol issue 64. Uh, and of course she would start focusing a lot on characters like Dorothy. She would change, as everyone does, she changes, would change a ton of the world around it because I think that's what makes Doom Patrol special and different is Doom Patrol's almost a creator-owned vehicle under the guise of a property. It has all these different errors. It has all these different moments, but I think some of the best moments and some of the best stories are when you have an incredible writer that has something to say, teaming up with great artists, and they are, you know, wanting to tell this amazing story and are inserting their original creations. Uh, a lot of the kids hate saying this self inserts uh, for good or bad. I know people love and hate that. However, Grant Morrison, Rachel Pollock and Gerard way clearly had some of that going on. And I think it made it all the better because I think it allows the world of doom Patrol to truly feel even more unique. And Pollock getting back to semi self inserts, but also new creations, old creations, and creations that fit this run perfect. And the kind of the character I'm going to be focusing on, one of Rachel Pollock's longest lasting legacies in comics was a creation of Kate Godwin. Now, uh, her debut was in Doom Patrol 70, named after trans writer Kate Bornstein and Chelsea Goodwin. Kate's power was focused on, derived from kind of the left-hand path. She uh, was also DC's first trans character. Her origin slash power story essentially while working as a sex worker, Kate took Rebus on as a client, and it ended with this magical explosion of orgasm, sex, mystical powers, uh, the the ether entering her, all this kind of craziness, and when essentially turning her into the character Coagula, getting power set based through that, uh, and eventually. Uh, in her first issue, she uh, fights with a cod man, uh, who is an over-the-top Doom Patrol type of character, and uh, and of course that leads to her eventually joining the Doom Patrol. Now, again, her fir- her little her first her first appearance, it's very clear. Even though they don't flat out say that she's a trans character in the beginning, you have all kinds of these subtle. Subtle clues, subtle buildups, and things that make it very clear to anyone who knows what's going on. But here's the beauty of it. That's looking through the eyes of 2023. When you look back at it, it is amazing how well her debut is handled, I think. I think uh, Doom Patrol issue 70 is one of my personal favorite issues of Doom Patrol. I think it, it's crazy, it's weird, chaotic, but I also think it's this introduction of a character that fits so well in the Doom Patrol world instantly. It's the same thing I loved about whether it be Flex Mentalo's introduction, Danny's introduction, Rebus's introduction, uh, Lotion of the Cat's introduction, Casey Brink's introduction, all these types of characters that are clearly near and dear to the creators and writers' are, hearts and who they are, and kind of the vessel to tell this era of the story. Uh, I love those issues, and this is no different. Issue 70 is one of those great issues that, uh, if you've never read it, go out and get it. Go out, go to, go to Amazon now. Get it. It's like $2 digital. Go to, if you can find the physical one. Uh, a spoiler, everyone should go buy the Rachel Pollock omnibus that came out recently. Go buy that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
when she joins New Patrol, Cliff and Kate connect uh, after Cliff's recent realization that uh, his want to be invulnerable and destructive as a kid in many ways led to life of trauma and where he's at now. Uh, they bond over their unique outlooks and experiences. Paula Cata originally intended uh, Kate to be drawn different than her original appearances. And it's something I, going back to just the lack of respect and the constant uphill battle she always had to fight in many, many ways. Uh, she wanted Kate to be drawn with broader shoulders, kind of more accurate depiction of someone who was male to female. And uh, most of the artists that worked in the book, sadly, just kind of ignored her notes and made Kate, for the most part, a more traditional, good-looking blonde character. Which is nothing, again, nothing's wrong with that, but it's just another example of even when she was trying to get this character across, she was still being micromanaged and censored in ways that she couldn't control and that were on others, but still kind of hiding more and more of the real story that was meant to be there from the beginning. Uh, when Cliff learns uh, that she had transitioned, uh, in his ignorance claims that, you know, if she ever had a penis, she she was still a man. And there's a great moment where she turns the tables and asks Cliff, you know, if he has a penis because he's a man. And, of course, Cliff being the robot man, he ain't got no dick. This uh, baffles Cliff. He has no biological way to come back at her. He has no way to fight against her. And it's another incredible use of the characters and showing the differences uh, the writers can make on each era of Doom Patrol but also bringing that personal touch and bringing that real life persecution that she has faced into the fold, being able to point out such a clear comic book example of like, what the fuck are you talking about? We change names, we change bodies, we change powers all the time. And you're going to be a bigot about this. It's a great moment of, of absurdity and beauty. And in a moment that, uh, I think again, pinpoints a struggle that, Although I have not faced, I uh, many close to me have, and I've. It's very rare to see accurate depictions in the fiction media, even when they have the best intentions of moments like that. And in that one, it is. And of course, it's a uh, Pollock's core theme of her run was identity and kind of being yourself, but also uh, this subtle theme of passing for normal in a world that has no normal. What we what we say is normal is a constant goalpost moving feat. Uh, if you say this is normal, then they change it down the road and it ends up being the classic cliche of it doesn't fucking matter. It's normal. Uh, be you. It shouldn't matter what haircut you have. It shouldn't matter what shorts or pants you wear. If you have to dress and act some way that you don't feel is true to yourself to hang out with people or be in a certain scene, then fuck that scene and fuck those people. And it's great to see again, the Doom Patrol be prime example of that. Uh, ultimately, kind of this run and this idea led to Kate using essentially the power of her own lived life of the transgender woman to save the world. And I, there's something so beautiful about that because that's something, again, only, not to compare them, but Morrison, Pollock, and Way are the only writers and the only Doom Patrol eras that in my head I think really, really nail throughout there's a core theme throughout there's a shared theme and an evolution of those themes for different eras and different times and from different points of view but i think they all add an extremely valid and extremely awesome notion to it uh sadly after this run paul it kind of uh had a few more comics come out but she would kind of retract from that world and would rededicate herself uh to tarot not to say that it's sad to rededicate yourself to tarot. Uh, for me, I'm just jealous because uh, she's an incredible writer and I would have loved to see her on basically every title that <laughs> possible. If you name it, I would love to see it. Like a, th all the way to from the bottom to the top, from Doom Patrol to Batman and Superman, I, you bet your ass I've been all over a Rachel Pollock Batman run. That'd be incredible. Uh, the closest thing I can think of in recent years for comics in 2019, she contributed to the comic horror anthology Theater of Terror, Revenge of the Queers. Uh, and that was kind of her most recent, unless I'm missing something obvious that people will uh, leave a comment for or come back to me with. Uh, that's her most recent output as far as that goes. And of course, she uh, would struggle 
uh, with her health in her in later years, but fortunately, kind of being able to, it seems like, be around close ones and loved ones uh, when she did pass, and leaving a legacy of this fucking badass fighter. I mean, this is someone who we talk about all the time. Nowadays, you hear more and more of people becoming themselves, of people coming out, of people uh, being, you know, people being able to come out as trans openly. And we still face so much people all around, whether you are trans or, just, or someone who allies trans or someone around trans, whatever it might be, who, whatever your relationship, everybody is much more aware of the transgender plight. However, very few know what what anyone goes through much less someone who is part of a group that is so persecuted for no fucking reason other than just being themselves to this day uh in many ways right now of course being even harder for many people to come out openly because we've taken several i don't want to say we've taken several steps back in a lot of ways i feel like we're in the death throes of an of a dying generation that are desperately trying to maintain the power that they once had and are asserting themselves more than ever to give the illusion of of superiority when they know that their time is coming up and the dinosaurs will die. Uh, and people like Rachel Pollock living the life that she led and live, being able to be herself despite the persecution, despite the hatred. I mean, for fuck's sakes, up until 20, I want to say 19, we didn't have the fucking Rachel Pollock Doom Patrol omnibus. It wasn't easily, it was one of the few Doom Patrol runs that you could not get easily at all which was always very fucked because it came right after morrison's run and it's in some ways a more direct continuation than almost any other doom patrol run has been since morrison took over uh and we didn't get that till like 2019 and it's just which again go go fucking buy last time i looked this on sale on amazon literally right now so whenever if you're listening to this pretty close to release date go on amazon and buy that because if you can get that for I don't care, cover price or cheaper, get it. They're amazing books. I know I haven't talked as much about the Doom Patrol run itself as I do in other ones because I really want to celebrate Pollock as a person, first and foremost, because her history, who she is, is incredible. I can't think of another writer, uh, for the most part, that has had such an incredible life and who kind of barely touched the comics world but yet that small touch in the comics world has left a very inspirational mark that over time is being more and more appreciated. Uh, for a long time, the Pollock run, a lot of people, whether it be they didn't want to read it, they didn't hear about it, they didn't hear good news about it, they didn't know what to think of it, there wasn't, you know, again, it wasn't easily available for a long time. A lot of people haven't experienced it. A lot of people haven't given it a chance. If you're here just for Doom Patrol, fucking read the Pollock run. If you're here for her, for anything else, her other work I've, I've mentioned, uh, check it out. Because, again, it is fantastic. She did not put out bad shit. And, again, she had from a young age and uh, doing these studies learned about some of the stuff that she really liked. It's hell interesting because she grew up loving Captain Marvel and the Marvels. Uh, as a kid, one of her <laughs> biggest uh, confusions about comics was she found it very weird that different books had different artists and it confused her a lot about you know, what made what, who made what, what story, how were they connected, were they connected, were they not connected? Uh, she was a huge fan of Jack Kirby, especially in Fantastic Four. Loved the Kirby satires at DC, especially the ones of like Roy Thomas. I was a huge fan of Forever People. Uh, again, it just touched the lives of so many people. Like, it's one of those people that not a single person that uh, I know personally that has met her. Not a single person that I just am a fan of that uh, was close with her. I have not heard any, not a single negative story at all. And when someone lives a life as persecuted and hated in some ways as she did, you best believe people are going to try to dig up all the dirt they can. So the fact that it's not readily available says a ton. The fact that uh, the few people I know that have had that you know had moments with her had nothing but the nicest most genuine thing to say if you look up any of her interviews uh everyone is so sincere is so thoughtful is so nice and i will say like record you know doing research for this one it was interesting because there's a, a lot of info out there about her 
tarot work. There's a lot of interviewers talk, who will interview about a tarot work and not, sadly, not a lot else. I will say, if you want a more in-depth written article, uh, Samantha Rydell for uh, them, the website, uh, around last year did a great, uh, great article. I was talking about, mostly about uh, the creation of Kate, the creation of the first DC trans superhero. Uh, she does a lot about uh, Pollock in that. That's a great that's a great resource. There's a couple of great interviews out there with with her. Uh, again, a lot of them are focused on tarot, and they're all very, very, very interesting. I know uh, Comics by Perch did a great interview where they focused on the comics. Uh, you had uh, Justin Michael had an interview with her that was really good, focusing on more the tarot side of things. But yeah, no, overall, this is just someone that... I know I'm probably repeating myself quite a bit here, but I think it's worth repeating just... Uh, how how fucking strong of a person she was how strong of an idol she uh, should be for a lot of people and just again how fucking badass she was i can't imagine i as a as you know a bi individual i had the hardest time coming out as bi for a long time I, you know, have, do not have the fucking, have to face what a lot of people in the LGBTQ community have to, because, you know, I'm, I'm a six foot three professional wrestler. At the other day, most people, if they don't like them to buy, just walk away, they don't give a shit. I'm not someone who transitioned from male to female in the seventies and lived my entire life having to face, you know, first, second, third, and all these waves of hatred, of progress, of denial, and back and forth. She's a fucking, you know, she was a fighter and someone who should be admired, someone whose name should be higher up there when you talk about great writers. Uh, and when you, again, when you talk about someone who has affected all these different worlds, there are so few people out there that have really done it. I think that's why I love Doom Patrol. And again, going back to kind of why I call the Holy Trinity of Doom Patrol, uh, the only, you know, Grant Morrison did that, whether it be through writing, comics, uh, <laughs> movies, TV, everything he's been part of, of course, Gerard Way, with the music, the comics, the TV, and everything else, and Pollock with the tarot, the comics, the writings. I mean, I think when people can have these incredible interests and have this incredible light in them and they're able to put it out into the world and add way more positivity than negativity, it's something that always should be celebrated. And this is someone that I don't care what you identify as. This is someone for just a simple fact that they were unwilling to change themselves to anything other than themselves. It's worth a ton of admiration. Cause we live in a world where some of the fucking most, you know, strong ass, tough ass wrestlers. I know in the back room, those same wrestlers, are terrified to do some of the shit that they really want to do because they think the crowd will hate them because it's not the strong guy shtick or it's not the typical shtick you think. Some of the most fucking badass punk motherfuckers I know that'll die in a pit are also the first ones that will freak out if they're wearing the, you know, the wrong fucking shirt at the wrong show or some shit. Like, I think if anything can be learned uh, through all this, it's a classic, uh, hey, be yourself. It's hard as fuck. But you'll be happier. It's it'll be much 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 better experience. And you know what? Even if it's not, even if you fucking have to go through shit to be yourself, that's something they can't take away from you. They can try to put every mask they want to on you, but once you take those masks off and you're you, they, whether they love it, hate it or not, fucking you get to be you, and that's the ultimate prize. <laughs> what a weird cliche kind of fucking pep talk thing they end this on. Uh, yeah, this one, I know it's probably a bit scattershot and all over the place. Uh, Rachel Pollock, not only, you know, rest in peace, rest in power, uh, kudos to a life not only well lived, but fucking all the admiration and love in the world for a life worth living in a life that you fucking showed, showed the naysayers how wrong they were in many, many ways. And I think, I think her name over time will just continue to grow in respect for what she did and who she was and i think looking back at it again just the fact that when i talk about someone being ahead of their time normally you say that and like oh this song is from 1992 and it sounds like it came out 2002 no this was someone that was 
fucking openly living the struggle before a lot of people even knew what the struggle was. And it, again, should be fucking celebrated. So right now, your homework after this one, fucking go out, read some Rachel Pollock Doom Patrol. I don't care if it's just one random issue you find in the back bin. It doesn't matter if it, you've never read an issue before or an issue after. Pick that shit up. You know what? Go fucking pick up her tarot books. Go pick up, go pick up Unquenchable Fire if you can find it. For God's sake, go pick that book up. It's amazing. It's weird and bizarre, but it's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Other homework? Uh, be you go do something tonight that is the most you thing you can think of till next time thank you guys so much for listening uh it will always mean the world to me that this show gets people to actually show up uh again we've got some crazy something's coming the next episode you know what let me know leave me a call leave me a review Uh, i am the real jason way on twitter instagram all that shit let me know do you prefer this podcast kind of being deep dives focused on the creators do you prefer it being focused on the run You're like a 50 50 mix uh whatever it might be let me know uh because this episode was a great one it's kind of again it was a hard one it should, i wanted it to be out a long time ago but with her passing i also didn't i didn't want it to seem like i was trying to take advantage of her passing just for views or listens but i also want to properly celebrate it so hopefully for people who just wanted to be here and celebrate it You're here now, and, you know, tell me your favorite moments from her run. Tell me your favorite moments uh, from her books. Whatever you think of, just celebrate her for a while. Celebrate her from now on. Celebrate her for who she was. Celebrate her for what she inspired in you. Celebrate her for what she inspired in others. No matter what, go out today and celebrate her and celebrate yourself. And I will see you guys later.